Welcome to How's the Market, a podcast from your friends here at Keeping Current Matters, where we host conversations that'll help you save time and build confidence so that you can stand out as the market expert. Today's conversation on the podcast is with Elisa Essig. Elisa joined the real estate industry in 1996. She's got 25 years plus of experience as an agent, a team leader uh, in Baltimore, Maryland, and in Pennsylvania, in Philly. You're going to you're gonna enjoy this conversation. And there are three things that I want to sort of draw out before we hop in. First, she knows her market. This is the How's the Market podcast, so listen for the, you know, sort of the subtle nuance of the things that she is doing to know and then communicate her market. Second, she has a foolproof buyer consultation. She's going to lay it out and I want you to listen for that. And three, the boundaries she has set in her business that allow her to serve clients well, but also keep a strong mindset through that. So let's go ahead and jump right in. Alicia, it is great to have you on the podcast today. Grateful for you joining. Honored to be asked to join you. That is great. Well, thank you for for joining. Given that, given that you are uh, there in Costa Rica, and uh, it certainly looks beautiful. Hey, anything for for David Childers and KCM. So, before we hop in, give everybody a sense of who you are, Alicia. Your team. You're from Baltimore. You're not from Costa Rica. I but, am not. Uh, but give everybody just a sense of that of your world relative to the business and family and uh, and, and everything that makes that up. Sure. So um, uh, this year, actually, in just like under two to three weeks, I will be celebrating 25 years in the real estate industry. Um, I am a college dropout and I came home and I was like, I have no idea what I'm going to do. And I bounced a few jobs and I wound up finding a job at a company that was actually helping people find apartments. And uh, when I learned and went through their training, I was like, you know, I like this whole gig of helping people find homes. So I... um, I saw that the the model that this company had was kind of dying because it was 97, 98, and the internet was showing up on the scene. And so I was like, okay, this is not going anywhere, but I like this gig. Let me go get my real estate license. And I did. And so uh, I've worn a lot of hats in my 25-year tenure. I, I've been a solo agent. Um, I stepped into a management role in 2007 uh, for a local large brokerage, Long & Foster. Um, that actually turned out to be a, a colossal disaster, not because of Long & Foster or anything else, but because I was just green and didn't know what I was doing. Uh, I gave it a try at a different company and was super successful. I built one of their offices from the ground up in the middle of the massive recession um, that we had in 08, 09 to be one of the most productive offices in the Baltimore area. Um, and I loved that, and I learned so much about leadership and culture and training and motivation and skills and planning and just everything and and also how the the female leadership role is so very different than the male leadership role um and so you know as i grew and and had two baby girls i was like okay like now i gotta i gotta get going on this even more because the men and women thing is so different so in 2015, when I had then been in the leadership role for there about nine years, um, I was like kind of itching for something a little bit different, but still in the same real estate industry. And literally out of the blue, I get an email from the Tom Ferry organization that's like, hey, we, we think you'd be a great coach. And I was like, <laughs> me? <laughs> so... Um, you know, I went down that journey of the vetting process, the training process, um, was invited to become a coach for Tom Ferry, which then only just fueled it because then I was doing more, you know, agent development, life skills, you know, like there's so much about being a real estate professional. And I'll, I'll say it that way because you have, you know, the skills and the sales side, but then you know, when part of my installation speech, I was also the president of the Greater Baltimore Board of Realtors in 2018. And like I said in the beginning of this, when you ask me, it's like a gift, right? It's like an old friend. Um, I'll never forget, you know, when I had my babies, you can step back if you want to. You can take your foot off the gas. And real estate will always be there when you get back. Um, you know, right. my dad my dad died. and uh, right. Or he had, a, he had a massive stroke. And I was able to 
say to my colleagues, hey, can you, can you help me out? And that culture of that kind of office is what I am now hell-bent on continuing to build and grow. And it's the leadership right. style that I continue to teach to um, my agents. Anybody that I'm coaching in the Tom Ferry organization is that collaborative, like, collaboration over ego, co- you know, yeah, we're independent contractors, but if we don't work together, then, you know, you are going to feel very, very isolated. So there's enough business to go around even now. Um, and, yeah. you know, it's it's there. And it's just, it, like I said, it's an old friend. And I celebrate 25 years this August 16th. I'm so excited. That is awesome. Yeah. That is awesome. I appreciate you sharing that. You have a wealth of... You know, knowledge in the business. You're a coach, so you see perspective that others are sharing with. Here's what I was gonna gonna tell you though. When I was thinking about you and I doing this and being on the podcast, um, I was immediately, you know, kind of rocketed back to the time during COVID, where you and I were. I think on the How's the Market podcast with yep. Tom. Yep. Two or three times, you know, several yep. times during COVID, and kind of went through that and uh, and and walked a, a lot of that, um, you know, relative to what's happening in the market and all the things that we would do back then during that. And I just want to say thank you for all that you um, have done in that and just being there as a rock in in the business. And I know we want to get into and and I I love this and love talking about this. Just some of the things that you've gone through through that journey of COVID, but you know where we are today is very different than that market. You just mentioned it. There's enough business to go around. So, talk about what you're seeing right now in Baltimore, and just what the last year has been like, and how you're coaching through that relative to your team, and maybe even other agents that you're you're coaching right now. You know, in, in I think all businesses, and even more so in real estate, there's obviously two sides to anything. And one of that is data, which you are, you know, your company does such a great job at providing us data. And I'm so pumped for the local side of things. So thank you. <laughs> um, and the second side is, is uh, consumer psychology. And um, when before I dropped out of college, I was studying psychology, and I'm fascinated okay. by human behavior. Um, I'm very, very attuned to human behavior, um, so I can sense, and I also have zero problems saying, hey, I sense something's off. What's going on? Tell me about it. Um, and I, I can be very direct, but um, Tom Ferry likes to call me, pa- um, what did he call me? Positive, uh, aggressive positivity. That's what he called me. Um <laughs> Which I think if you don't know me, I do come across as very intense because I I speak fast, I'm loud. Um, But once you get past that, you're like, oh, she's really soft and warm and and, and, and loving. And, um, you know, another really great coach in the Tom Ferry organization, David Caldwell, he he and I were chatting one time on his podcast about how we'd rather cry with you than fire you. And um, that's where my heart comes in. And, And this, these last gosh, seven or eight years, um, have been a wild roller coaster, both locally and nationally. And, you know, it's interesting because I, I, I have a team in both Baltimore and Philadelphia. Um, I don't know if you knew that or not. And so I have, no, I didn't, um, but, but yeah, talk about that. It has been interesting over the last few, um, couple of years since I have been licensed in Pennsylvania, um, to look at both markets and how interesting, um, I aligned myself, a little backstory to tie into what it is. I aligned myself when I first got licensed in 98 with a really high-performing office. And these were really professional people. They got up, they got dressed, they showed up to the office every day, 9 a.m., full suits. They were, And I was sort of enamored by that. That's why I was like, I wanted to be that. They knew the stats. They knew the market conditions. And I remember... um, a, a wise uh, veteran agent probably 20 years ago at this point he said to me, you know, Baltimore's a little insulated because we're so close to D.C. because of the political political scene, right? Um, okay. And um, the fact that because the government is almost always in operation, and I'm not going down politics here, um, but with the government always being in, in operation, there's a ripple effect of every industry. And so in, in D.C., you know, Southern Maryland, Baltimore, a lot of people will live in Baltimore and commute to DC. 
that being said, you know, there were certain areas of Baltimore that did not get the same 30, 40 percent hit that um, other parts of the country saw in 2008, 9 and 10. There were maybe 10, 15 percent drops in 2008. 9 and 10, which I found very interesting because it reinforced what that wise agent once told me. Fast forward to now, um, you know, inspired by you and KCM, um, I, before you guys launched the local, I had dug into my own statistics because I was like, you know, the real estate industry is so magnanimous that, you know, an interest rate alone can't create what we are um, working with right now. And I'm not even going to say challenged or hit with or some negative word because I think that you have to be able to be flexible and adaptable because if you're not, then that's when you're going to fall down and go, okay, sure, I'm, I have nothing going on. So the industry is always going to change. Change is the one thing we can always expect. So I was like, okay, what is going on here? So I started tracking the numbers of new listings versus pendings for every month. Well, I do when it. When did you month. start that? Um, in January of this year. But okay. um, I went back all the way to 2015. Okay. Um, and so in January of 2022, we put in the greater Baltimore area, which is encompassing of several, like a large metro area, we brought 1,743 new listings to market. That was January of 2022. Okay. In, In January of 2022, we pended or escrowed 2,400 listings. Okay. That trend is on point all across the board from January through June. So I've tracked tracked these. I can share the spreadsheet with you one day if you want. So for example, the seven year average from 2022 back to 2016 is that we bring about 1,800 new listings to the market in January every, for the last six years, about 1,800 listings. Okay. Okay. And for the last seven years, and I'm not including 2023 in this, for the last seven years, we've pended 2,600 listings. Okay. So that's almost 800 list 800 houses that we've been eating away at that at that inventory quote unquote surplus back from 9, 10 and 11. We've been eating yep. away at this consistently every single month. The gotcha. and, yep. and and this is the case I would say all across this board and in Philly too. So for exa- and I can, like I said I'm I'm happy to share the spreadsheet with you but For, you know, 108 months, which is at this point six months times however many years, six months times seven years, we've always sold more than we brought to market. So, for example, in 2015, the existing inventory before new, you know, January, let's say January 2015, we had 6,000 listings on the market, right? We brought the the normal 1,700. That's 2014. Now, January 2023, we had 2,000 listings existing. Because of all those months, we've been chewing away at that existing inventory. I hear a lot of people complain about what's current, right? Right. What's like today. But they don't think about what has been going on. Nobody, you know, people... People in 2014, 15, 16, 17, even 18 were like, oh, my God, the housing market's still so bad. No, it's not. Right. We're consistently selling more houses than we're bringing to market. It seemed like it was still bad because we still had a lag excess from 9, 10, and 11. And people aren't realizing that. How do you – because – what you're saying here is in my market, I know my numbers. There are some external factors that, you know, DC sort of insulates some of that market to your earlier point and the government always being on, doesn't see the fluctuations maybe that some other markets do. How do you then take that information in a simple way and communicate mm-hmm. it to a buyer, you know, that's coming in or, or a seller or how do, how do you really articulate that in a way that they're like, Hey, they're, they're not going to want to know what happened in 2015 with new and existing listings, but, but telling that story. So telling that story is very simple because you, you get a lot of, um, 
you know, I'm a Taylor Swift fan. Haters going to hate, 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 right? So, um, <laughs> so you get people who want that train wreck, right? Yep. And, you know, so track it, that's where you combine the data with the psychology. Um, and so to your point, you know, you obviously have to read who you're talking to. If the person that I am having a conversation with just seems like he wants, he or she wants to hate, right? I may not even bother, to be honest. Right. If the person... What do you do in that case? Did you just listen at that point? Uh-huh. What's the psychology piece of that? Uh-huh. That's what I, I think listen. people want to know. I, yeah, I just go, oh, that's that's really interesting. I, I probably use the word interesting way too much um, because interesting <laughs> can go either way, right? Like, right. you know, <laughs> hey, what do you think of that wallpaper? It's interesting. Yeah. I love it. Oh, you do? Really? It's beautiful. Um, oh, my God, I hate it. Yeah, it's pretty gaudy. You know, it's, it's, yeah. you know, I just kind of stay neutral in that interesting word. And I just use my spidey senses, which I know, you know, you have to be in tuned with human behavior. So I just take a, a, I take real note on what I think their intent is with the questioning. Is their questioning, sure. is, are they baiting me or are they genuinely curious? Are they baiting me yeah. to try and get into a political discussion? Because if they are, yeah. I'm just not even going there. If they see, so, you know, and sometimes I may say, you know, are you genuinely curious? Because I, I've been tracking the data since 2015 and I kind of just shut up. Right, right. That's such an important point because in the example that you gave, it's somebody sort of saying like, it's not that good. And I want to hear you validate that what I think. Correct. Right. Versus right. somebody you genuinely saying, are you asking? Are you curious? Are there anything right. psychologically that you look at when somebody, that, you know, is is being sort of truthful in that or, or or intentional in saying, "I really want to know." Yeah, if they say, "I really want to know," then then I I can launch in. I, you know, if you, you can't tell, I I have no problem talking, um, and so <laughs> sometimes I know I talk too much, um, and so I try to be mindful of my own self and say, okay, does this person want a quick answer or do they want a detailed answer? So sometimes I might just give a quick one and I might say, yeah, yeah. well, I've been tracking the data um, month over month uh, for the first six months of the year since 2015 and we've consistently sold more real estate than we've brought new listings to market ever since then. So this is not a pandemic problem. This is not a government problem. This is just, we have had a high demand for real estate for people purchasing real estate since 2015 or even further back. Let me ask you a, a question here. You have, uh, I'm going to say famously said, buyers in contr- are in control of this market or yep. in control of the market. Talk yep. a little bit about how you work with buyers right now, um, mm-hmm. your buyer presentation. I want people to get a sense of that sure. that may worry about working with buyers right now. If people going, I don't know, you know, kind of baiting somebody to say, should I really buy a home right now? You know, asking that mm-hmm. question. Remember I mentioned the company that helped people find apartments. So they mm-hmm. had this, this amazing training that they called the cycle of service. And it was literally on this like 11 by 14 training page and it literally had a circle on it and it was like from the phone call to how you get them to come into the office to the discovery section to then pairing them with the apartment communities and setting up the appointments to closing the, the what we called closing the rent. And um, I had my first client, my first buyer client in um, in 99 that uh, was an, an expired letter that I, I sent out and I sold their house and they she needed to buy a new house. And that girl rang me around like, you know, a puppy on a leash. And uh, and once I finally put her in a house, I literally was like, wow, <laughs> there has got to be right. a better way <laughs> than this because this just sort of sucks. Um, so uh, I was like, wait, why why can't I apply this same training from that apartment locator service to real estate. And so I just adapted it. And when I would get, when I would meet somebody in an open house, get a, you know, a good old realtor.com lead because Zillow didn't exist back then. Um, when I would get, you know, any kind of, you know, what they called internet lead, um, you know, again, way back in the day, or even if it was just a friend, I would just simply say, you know, um, I'd let let the person get it out. Usually they're nervous to make that call. 
you know, just like I said before, I always assess the situation. People think I talk a lot and I don't listen, but I actually very much am very, uh, I observe a lot. And so I assess the situation and I'm like, okay, um, I'm like, oh, that must be so exciting. Meet them where they are. That must be so exciting. Okay. I, I'm so excited to work with you. Um, let me tell you how we serve our clients best. So the way I describe that is I feel like I am taking the reins at that point, right? Because I yeah. don't want to be bossed around by anyone, especially a consumer. I want to get paid and they want to find a house. So let me tell you how we best serve our clients. What we do is we um, have a meeting together either. Now I have evolved this 20 years. Okay. So this is the 2023 script, the 2020, the 20, no, the 1998 script was different. Go ahead. Let me pause you and ask you this question as you, as you tell this buyer piece, is sure. it non-negotiable that you are in the off and you, they're in your office? So again, uh, no, it's not non-negotiable. Okay. It can either be okay. virtual. Like I said, there's, that okay. was the difference before virtual was a, was a option accepted right and no, well no in 1999 and, and 2000 there was none of this this didn't exist so um right. uh i didn't have to meet them in the office per se uh that was my preference i could meet them in like a starbucks or a coffee shop but for the most part people just met me in my office um once in a while if i had like a really good friend um and and that's the key here people don't treat their friends the same way they treat strangers and that's where they get caught up all the time mm. so you know if it's a friend you know i would do it at my house because i didn't need to have them at the office but i still met with them and i still went through the process okay so i so the updated version is you know hey this is how we serve our clients best what i like to do is meet with you um, first, so that we can review the entire process of home buying, whether it's the finances, what you're looking for, uh, the laws, who represents who in the transaction. You know, we cover all the things so that there's no questions. Also, answer any of your burning questions. It takes about 90 minutes, and we can do it virtually or in person. Which do you prefer? Now, okay. I would say it's 50 50. Okay. Right. Because a lot of people are way more used to doing meetings virtually now. Um, in the past, like even before it was sexy to do things virtually or do virtual showings, um, we moved a Under Armour executive from Panama to Baltimore, did the entire thing virtually. The best agents know what's happening nationally and also know what's going on in their local market. At Keeping Current Matters, we help real estate agents become experts. And now, we've added something that will change the way you communicate. KCM Local. With KCM Local, you'll now have access to local data, national insights, and powerful visuals, all in one place. To be the local expert, visit KeepingCurrentMatters.com. So you have the meeting either personal, personally or, um, virtual. or virtually, then mm -hmm. what happens next? Okay, so there's three sections and uh, about 30 minutes each section. The first section is you're getting straight to the point with buyer agency laws, how, who represents who, um, you know, make sure you understand your local jurisdiction, what, you know, what goes into that agency. Also, okay. anything else that is relative to your local market. If you're in Florida, talk about hurricanes. If you are in um, California, talk about earthquakes. If you're in Minnesota, talk about the deep freeze, right? If you have somebody moving in from out of town that doesn't understand the actual geography, it's time there for that to do that as well. Um, so this is also your opportunity to um, control what I say, control the client where you say to the client, don't click. I want more information on Zillow. Don't walk into an open house um, without telling me. Don't um, walk into new construction without telling me, you know, this is any, again, any of the things that frustrate you, this is okay. your opportunity to say, Hey, don't do those things. And so okay, I you're get setting right expectations there. setting up expectations. If you have working hours that you prefer, tell people right up front, Hey, I tend to stop working around seven o'clock. So if it's nothing important, then I'm, you know, I probably won't answer. Feel free to email or text me. I'll get back to you the next day. 
However, you know, my policy is if we're negotiating a contract or home inspection repairs or something that has a deadline, I, I, I'm going to make myself available. I'm not that hardcore. But that yeah. first 30 minutes is all for you to be able to really set up your boundaries and guidelines and that working relationship and also you to state your fee. This is what I get paid. And if I'm not paid by the seller, then I'm going to need you to pay me. And if that doesn't work, we're going to have to have a conversation because I'm not a nonprofit realtor. Period. Yep. Step okay. two. Step two kind of has two parts. It's what I call the discovery section. The discovery section is we're saying, hey, David, what do you want? Right? And you're going to say, right. well, I, uh, I'd like, uh, I, I want, and, and you might get tripped up. And, you know, depending, again, on where you live, the questions are going to have to be rooted in what your housing stock and neighborhoods look like. Um, and if somebody's like, I don't know, I'll start off with, okay, urban, suburban. They'll go suburban. Okay. Are we talking lots of land in between houses or, you know, you, you know, houses, right? And again, that's because yeah. I have that kind of housing stock. Or do you want to be out in farm country, more rural, right? I have all of that to be able to provide in my two markets. Then you get into a discovery about the house. Do you want something? Again, I have all the housing styles. New, old, right. wood floors, tile, carpet. So you're defining What's, what they're looking for and yeah, how to, how to so match them. So many, every, yep. like every discovery question you can think of, how many bedrooms, how many bathrooms, what kind of housing stock do you like? Um, what do you do when you're not working? Um, okay. Do you know people here? Where do your friends live? Where are you working? What kind of commute do you want? Um, an example, I had a client moving to Baltimore from Texas. And in Texas, what they're used to is slab houses with no basements, and almost every house has a garage. And during this discovery process, the person says to me, well, I have to have a garage. But they were coming here to work for a, a company that was in the city, um, and they wanted no more than a 15-minute commute. Well, that gave me an opportunity to say, well, the way our city was literally built, you're not going to get a garage within 15 minutes unless you A, spend more, or go further out. So gotcha. which one's more important? So that just saved me two days in the car showing them houses. Which one's more important, a garage or your commute? I get to learn right then and there which one is going to win. So really drilling in and asking those questions also helps you overcome objections about the market conditions or just plain old housing stock. The second right. part of the second section is a soft qualification. Now, on my YouTube and, um, you know, on Tom's, whatever you can find, I show you how to old school calculate a mortgage payment using the amortization chart, right? So right. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with that, but I then go into how much cash do you have? How much money do you want to spend? How much does your mortgage payment want to be? Um, you know, we talk about all of that. And again... I had a VA buyer not too long ago. This was like 2019, I think. She came to me, and they wanted um, they wanted to buy a house. And I and I got to the money part, and I said, "How much cash do you have?" And they were like, "None." Right. And I was like, "That's not how this works." Right. Um, and uh, and she's like, "Well, we have a VA loan. That isn't that 100% financing?" Yes, yes, it is. But you still need cash to buy a house, and you need X amount of dollars, and then. I pulled out a bunch of Alta statements where this is a VA loan and this is how much money they had right. to bring to the table. This is a VA loan and this is how much money to bring to the table. Now, again, I sensed that psychology side of things and I knew she was she was a strong girl, real strong, handling a lot of stuff. And I, I felt in my bones that I could be strong back with her. So I was able to say to her, I'm not showing you one single house until you have five grand in the bank. Right. She accepted that. She said, challenge accepted. Fine. I'll call you when we do it. Right. Did that That's save awesome. me time from having to show yeah. this girl houses and not realizing that she didn't have any money? Absolutely. Yes. Right. Right. So right. there's a whole money component. And I think real estate agents oftentimes think that, you know, that's the lender's job. That's not my job. And what they do, and this is what for lack of a better, and I'm going to be serious, pisses people off is they say, I won't show you a house until you are pre-qualified by a lender. Right. I don't force a pre-qualification. My force is 
I want that appointment where I'm doing these three sections with you. Because I'm going to say, look, tell me, be honest with me before you call a lender, because I'll then be able to also recommend the proper lender that can best serve Given your the financial circumstances and the situation. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So that's that's uh, that's the second part okay. of step two. Step three. Most important part is now you're taking what you've heard about what they want, where they're looking, what kind of houses they want. And you plug that into either your MLS or whatever search portal you can. And you either share your screen or you put it up on the on the the TV in your office, wherever wherever you are, you share your screen and and, you know, cast a wide net because, again, this is your first pass. Right. So David says to me as a buyer that I want to live in the city and I want to spend this much money and I want, you know, something totally renovated and super sexy and super contemporary. And okay, so I plug in all of that. Right. And I pull up all the houses and I start showing them to you right on the computer screen. And I say, listen, you know, there's the exercise here is I want to be able to vicariously see what you see through your eyes. So when I am, I want you to be vocal here. So tell me, what does this house do for you? And you're going to go, eh, that's okay. All right. Well, and I start clicking through the pictures and I listen to your reaction, right? If you're silent, I'm like, okay. Especially in the beginning, I'm like, I need you to talk to me here. Like, I don't care if you don't like these houses. If you think they're ugly, tell me they're ugly so I know what you don't like. If you like them, tell me that you like them. So then people start to get with the program. I am then able, as the real estate professional, to really see what you respond to. I role played this with um, with one of the agents on my team, and um, I was just you know spouting off some stuff. Well, he picked a neighborhood in in the suburbs of Philly and he was showing me houses and I had a genuine reaction. I went, look at that sunroom. And he went, right. right. And he literally goes, Oh, I get it now. And, and what it was, (laughs) and here's why, because during the entire discovery section, I hadn't once said anything about a sunroom, but I saw that sunroom. I was enamored with it. And he goes, Oh, And so you see things when you do that third step that you didn't see when you do the discovery step. So you put it all together. You then save that search, send it to them, say to them, hey, you pick the first five houses. I think I have an idea of what you're looking for. Um, I go into that first tour with a full uh, expectation that they're not going to buy a house that day. This is discovery. Right? And I treat it like old school. And I think with the upcoming change, the, the, the change that's kind of on the docket right now, we will have to, you know, I, I, I won't need to get back to it because I still do it, but get back to more of a full service where, you know, right. the consumer is going to, is it wants to be served if they are paying a fee. So make sure that you are providing that service. I don't have to change because this is how I've been operating for 25 years. The right. agents who right. have been at, at the consumer's beck and call, they're the ones that don't like buyers, think their buyers are liars, um, feel like they get dragged around by a leash, and, and they're not the ones in control. I think that real estate agents in general feel like they have to be always on and always available because that's what the consumer wants. And maybe it is a little bit of what the consumer wants. But part of that is because we gave birth to that baby and then we fueled that baby by being always available. So when you get that referral... You created created that expectation. You created that expectation, exactly. Um, Now, is it it a societal thing too, that need now thing? Yeah, absolutely it is. Um, am I going to, you know, I'm not a great example doing this podcast from Costa Rica, but, um, <laughs> it, you know, I pick and choose what I want to do. And and I don't always answer the phone or, you know, or yeah. whatever. Like I, I say, hey, this is where I'm at. I've got a team in place. I've got an admin in place. Like you, you have to set up your own boundaries or you will let or the business will take over well, your life. Listen, our business is notorious for that. But I think your point in, because I want to draw a distinction here between the person that says, I need somebody Mm 24-7, and the person that realizes you have a family and you have boundaries on your business, I think most people would um, will respect that. In being in the business for as long as we have, they will respect it because... 
you know, when when you're going through a transaction, it's the biggest thing, obviously, you have going on in your life. Something happens at nine or ten o'clock. I'm going to reach out to Alicia. I'm going to let her know this, or I'm going to ask her this. Versus going, hey, I may send that over, but I know she's not going to, re- you know, return my call or my text until tomorrow, and that's totally cool, right? Um, it, but but I think drawing that line up front, which is hard. Oh, by the way, it, it, you know, in, in, in agents. How do you coach somebody? Because I, I have to think you've had this conversation. You're coaching somebody. You go through this. They're like, that's awesome. Alicia, I could never do that. Oh, my God. I've had plenty of those. Um, and, yeah. you know, it's it's very interesting. Um, I've coached someone who almost just refused to set boundaries. Yeah, sure. Um, and that person would... Um, answer texts, emails, and phone calls after they had been having some cocktails with friends. Yeah, yeah. Um, And, you know, (laughs) it's it's frustrating and it's interesting because sometimes, and again, I think people get sometimes the wrong impression of me because I'm so big and loud, um, you have to pause and think. Yeah. And so setting those boundaries up front, especially because most of the time, if you do get, you know, a communication attempt, no matter what it is, at a late time, they're usually in their heads about it. Yeah. And if you respond quickly, if you like fire back, your response is probably going to have an edge to it that's only going to fuel what they're in their head right. about. Right. So, you know, could, and, and this is the fear. Could the fear is that if I don't respond right now, I'm going to lose the client. Mm -hmm. That is essentially the fear. If I don't respond right now, I'm going to lose the client. And is that a valid fear? Sure. Sure. Because of that need now society. Yeah. But do you have to? No, because, and, and this is, I'll do this for you if you have another extra few minutes for it. Um, um, I do a time management exercise with every single person that I coach. And there is um, a little story that I tell to talk about it. So a professor stands in front of a class with an empty mayonnaise jar, some rocks about this big, some pebbles, and some sand. Have you heard this story, David? I have. Yeah, have tell to, it. I love have. it. Okay. And so... He stands in front of the class with this empty mayonnaise jar, and he takes the rocks, and he fills up the mayonnaise jar with the rocks. I don't know. Three or or four of them fit in the the jar. And he holds up the jar to the class, and he says, class, is the jar full? And the class says, yeah, it's full. So then he picks up these pebbles that are, you know, little marble-sized pebbles, and he pours them into the jar, and they kind of roll around and fill the, 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 the large gaps in between those rocks. And... The professor holds up the jar again and he says, is the jar full? And now the class is like, Haha, it's full now. And then he picks up the sand and he pours the sand in the jar and fills it all the way up. And he says, this jar represents your life. If you had put the sand and the pebbles in the jar, there wouldn't have been any room for the rocks. And the rocks represent the things that are so very, very important to you. That is your health, your family, your loved ones, your friends, right? This is... Things that if they were gone tomorrow, you'd be devastated. And the pebbles, they're important, but they will find their way. And the same is with the sand. They will always find their empty, they'll they'll always find the empty spaces. I find that real estate agents um, have the most trouble with their time management because they don't know what to do and when. So because they don't know what to do and when, When the phone does ring, they're so grateful that it had rang and so fearful that they're not going to get another opportunity that they answer it right then and there. And they think that if they are at everybody's beck and call, that that makes them a good realtor. But I don't think that that is the biggest reason that people think that somebody is a good service professional. We have just a couple of minutes left because I want want to... I know something that you're passionate about, and it 
kind of ties in with what you said, all the, you know, the rocks and the sand that are going to find their way about the reality of this business Mm -hmm. and how it can impact us, Mm -hmm. you know, with, with feeling overwhelmed and I've, I've heard you, um, tell your story relative to that, but I know that's an area that you're passionate about, of just being real about Mm -hmm. all of that and how that can weigh on, on folks. People want to be a team leader. Uh, I, I think one of the biggest reasons I hear that people want to start a team is, oh, I have too many leads. And, but what they don't realize is the amount of training and emotional burden, so to speak, that you are signing up for. I lived in real estate feeling like I needed to carry people's trauma and burdens because real estate sales usually is in conjunction with something that is big, right? It's usually in conjunction with having a baby, losing a baby. Those are the worst. Getting divorced, losing a spouse, losing a parent. You know, there's, I would say that buying a house or moving can tend to be more in the sad difficult category than it is the happy category, right? It's probably more that, right? You have a family that's lived in their house for 30 years. They've raised their entire family. It's bittersweet. They're so sad. They're so anxious. They don't know where they're going. They've only known this house, right? There's so much, right? So I can read people really well. And I, for the longest time, felt like I had to carry their emotions in order to be able to get them to their next space. Yeah. Fast forward to 2021, when I realized that the load of everybody's emotions from the pandemic years and all of my trauma years was too much to bear. And um, that is when, because that's when I decided that I needed to start working on myself so that I could be more for people, but in a more healthy way. And I think a lot of realtors also get into this business because they want to help people. And right. while that's all fine and good, they want to help people, but they don't realize that they actually have to help themselves first so they can right. really help people. And so those people, I'm bringing it all back around, those people that refuse to set boundaries for themselves are living in some semblance of a trauma world because they're so afraid of losing any and every opportunity. So they wind up making worse decisions for themselves because they don't set boundaries. Um, So if I can encourage anyone who has, you know, stayed with the podcast this long, you know, work out your big rocks. Your big rocks are everything that is super important However, the coaching nugget that I have with regards to that big rock is one of those big rocks in this business is lead generation and, and, and relationship building. If we aren't constantly nurturing and adding and growing to those relationships, then, then you will have a harder time in a more challenged market, just like now. So the people I see that are killing it in the market in 2020, what is it, three right now? Are the ones is, yeah. right? The ones who are really killing it are the ones who super leaned into all of their relationships, right? Their relationships with vendors, lenders, title, mortgage, business owners, their sphere of influence, their past clients, their neighbors, their you know whatever church organizations, educational organizations. You know, anytime what I preach to the rooftops right now that should be a big rock in everybody's jar is those relationships all of the relationships because that is what will continue to feed people's businesses in times like this where there is less business to be had so you know we've we've got 30 less 30 percent less business to be had there's a lot of people that aren't doing as much business right now it is what yeah. it is. Well, I, th- I think that point, and I just want to kind of underscore this as we wrap it up. I mean, because you've really walked through knowing your market to ultimately having a great interface 
with a client to, I'll say this, there's a difference between helping people and learning how to help people well. Mm, that's really good. You know, yep. Because, yep. because trying to, trying to bear that burden and bear the, you know, the business on your shoulders 24 seven all the time uh, doesn't work. Um, and, and I just, I want to say this, I appreciate you being transparent and also sharing what you've shared and being real in that, because I think it's something that, that, that people across the country face, realize, and it's, and it's hard to do that. Um, so, so thank you for that. My pleasure. Yeah. I think it is really important. I think that this this shroud, so to speak, of everybody, you know, I call it fake book. While I love it, it we get, yeah. you know, people's highlight reels. It's and, a perspective, and people, right? It's right. the best perspective. And I'd, I'd much rather be real and let people know, hey, right. you know what? No, I'm not, I'm not having the best day. You know, no, this yeah. is... This is hard. I it was harder for me to get out of bed this morning, or you know, yeah, I had to go get um, some chemical assistance to boost some some you know hormones or, or whatever. Diving into you know how does your body feel and cleaning up your diet and cleaning up the clutter and you know yeah. when you start aligning yourself with the right w- aligning yourself with the right mindset, then the right people start to align yourself. So back to something you asked me about setting boundaries and do I ever get a spidey sense that I'm like, "Mm, I don't want to work with this person. Same thing, right? When you start to set your boundaries, the right people show up, the right clients show up, the ones who I want to work with, even if it's a hard situation for them, it's divorce or whatever. I don't mind as long as there is that respect. Don't abuse me because I just will walk away from you. I'm done. And I encourage anyone if you're getting abused by a client put your foot down set your boundaries i'm grateful for you just joining today sharing what what you're up to and we've got to do this again for sure of course i would love to help you out absolutely thank you so much awesome thank you Thanks for tuning in to How's the Market. You know, the conversation with Alicia was amazing. When I talk to her, you just feel the genuineness, the passion, and just her care for the business. She knows a ton, and she's able to share a ton. I think we're all better off with her in the business and her sharing with us. So thanks for joining on that. Hey, at Keeping Current Matters, we believe every family should feel confident when buying and selling a home. And that's why we do this podcast. That's why we do what we do. It drives us every single day. So if you're looking for resources to help you do that, go to keepingcurrentmatters.com. And listen, if you know somebody that could benefit from this podcast, share it with them and subscribe so that you don't miss an episode. So here's to your success and I'll see you next time.